uh good evening all of you uh, and it's a pleasure uh, talking to uh, all the people here on this call uh this is a very very important uh, topic as we all know right esg is one of the most pertinent subject uh, that is just uh, so relevant in today's world right so it's a really a global topic it's a india topic it's you know there is government which is focused on it there are businesses which are focused and just as a common people i think all of us are focused on this important topic because this is really what is driving uh, you know the so society at large these days uh, and we know what is all happening around us and you know therefore how important it is uh, i have the i have a i have a great set of speakers today so you know komal introduced nachiketa and prateek and as we speak uh, there are there are significant developments that are taking place in the area of esg so uh, you know there is there has been global evolution there has been a evolution in india and sebi is getting into it in terms of you know you know how the corporate reporting or other sort of disclosures etc are coming we know there are going to be you know uh, investors focused on this there are uh, rating agencies and there could be uh, all as all stakeholders i think you know esg is very very important and as, as we speak i think businesses it is it is going to be extremely important for businesses right uh recently there have been development in some in terms of brsr reporting and you know our discussion today is more focused on on the corporate reporting or the sebi rules that have come out in form of brsr where you know i'll request nachiketa to talk about it post that uh, you know uh, i will have certain questions for uh, you know both nachiketa and prateek and you know uh, with the significant experience in this area we hope some of those points point of views will be really helpful to uh, everybody in the audience at the same time as audience please feel free to post some questions i will i will have uh, depending on depending on the time permissions and and obviously on the topic uh, we'll use some of those questions to post to nachiketa and prateek as well and then you know hope to get uh, deep insights from them both nachiketa and prateek practice esg very significantly and have a lot of regulatory and operational insights into this topic and you know i hope to uh, personally benefit and you know same thing it will be beneficial for audience i hope so uh, again nachiketa maybe as a start if i can request you to uh, you know take take us through uh, you know what's happening in esg especially the brsr reporting um, your thoughts and then we can uh, and, and i know you have a slide so maybe you want to present that as well and then you know after that we can have a q and a what do you sure. think thank you madhav thank you uh, let me just share my screen and uh... do let me know once the screen is visible it is visible is the screen visible it is it is visible yes okay great well uh very good evening to uh, everyone uh really glad that we are all able to connect today and as madhu pointed out uh, esg is becoming a topic that is uh, you know very frequently in the news if not uh, on a daily basis and uh, yes it has been evolving significantly both at the global as well as uh, india level and to kick off today's session we'll start with the india level first and uh, we'll talk about the business responsibility and sustainability report that is the brsr so i'm just going to change my slide uh is my uh, slide changing okay so yes. the brsr i mean what exactly is the brsr so the brsr uh, is the new reporting uh, standard uh, that has replaced the brr that is the business responsibility report which was mandatory for indian companies uh, the brsr is based on the national guidelines on responsible business conduct that is the ngrbc principles and it incorporates several key performance indicators uh, drawing from global best practices uh and in doing so the brsr also allows for cross referencing with uh, some of these other frameworks most notably the gri and the tcfd where companies are already reporting this uh the overall structure of the brsr report uh follows the similar pattern of the brr uh since it is an evolution on the brr so we have section a b and c uh each section has a very definite uh, purpose so section a talks about the general disclosures and the objective of this section is to present the very sort of you know basic information about the company about its operation products uh, employees csr activities uh, to the stakeholders uh, the section b talks about management and processes 
the main objective of this section is to allow the company to disclose information on its policies and processes and relate those to the NGRBC principles. Uh, and this basically allows uh, stakeholders to understand whether the company has the necessary building blocks in place to allow it to conduct business in a responsible manner and to then be able to demonstrate its performance. Section C, which is the largest of the lot, is the principle-wise performance. Uh, section C looks into specific metrics for each of the nine principles of the NGRBC. Uh, and within these nine principles also, there are specific carve-outs on what are the key KPIs that a company has to uh, prepare and disclose as part of its uh, BRSR. One important thing to keep in mind, uh, the BRSR as of today, uh, there is an option for companies to uh, you know, report on some KPIs uh, on a voluntary basis. So those are the leadership KPIs. But at the same time, there is a very large set of KPIs where mandatory disclosures are required. And these are the essential KPIs. Now, going forward, uh, the BRSR was mandated into force uh, as of financial year 22-23 onwards. Uh, although the mandate came out in May 2021, the SEBI gave a glided path to companies. And initially for FY 21-22, it was on a voluntary basis. But as of FY 22-23, it is mandatory for the top 1,000 listed entities by market capitalization in the country. At the same time, the SEBI has already been making some significant changes and updates to the BRSR. In its recent uh, you know, press release uh, at the end of March, 29th March 2023, the SEBI board has already uh, set out two key changes. Number one, it has already approved mandatory reasonable assurance for a select set of KPIs, which have been identified as the BRSR core. This BRSR core KPIs consist of uh, over 20 KPIs. Most of these KPIs are part of the existing BRSR comprehensive, but there are a few uh, additional KPIs which have been uh, added to this list, and we will come to it in due time. Going forward, uh, the SEBI will update the BRSR comprehensive as well to include all of the BRSR core KPIs. When we talk about reasonable assurance in the BRSR core, so the 20 BRSR core KPIs are again uh, distributed across the ESNG, that is the environmental, social, and governance factors. The prescribed glide path for this uh, reasonable assurance is starting with the top 150 listed entities by market capitalization for whom reasonable assurance is mandatory from FY23-24 onwards. And eventually, the goal is to extend this to the top 1,000 listed entities by market capitalization by FY26-27 onwards. In addition to this, the SEBI has also alluded to ESG disclosures for value chain of listed entities. Uh, and when we talk about value chain, uh, there is going to be a specific set of thresholds that the SEBI will be uh, you know, disclosing in due time that will give us more insights on who exactly is constituted in this value chain. Uh, will it be on the you know, basis of the turnover or will it be on the basis of the spend? The guidance on this is still awaited. But as uh, of the press release, what is clear is that you know, these requirements will be applicable to the top 250 listed entities by market capitalization on a comply or explain basis for disclosures starting from FY24-25 onwards and for assurance from the financial year 25-26 onwards. And all of this is in fact a movement towards getting companies to become more uh, aware of their sustainability performance and to start looking at this on a very serious basis because this will allow companies to leverage some of the other changes that the SEBI is bringing in, most notably a separate ESG core rating, which is going to be an additional ESG rating based on uh, you know, assured parameters of the BRSR core, as well as uh, uh, requiring you know, uh, ESG schemes uh, by ESG investors to have a certain percentage of assets under management in listed entities where assurance on BRSR core is undertaken. So in order for companies to 
get better ratings and for companies to get access to ESG funds, um, disclosures and reasonable assurance of BRSR code is going to be a key item going forward. What exactly is the BRSR code? So the 20 KPIs of the BRSR code are distributed across these nine uh, topic or theme areas. Uh, some of these are already pre-existing. They already are part of the BRSR comprehensive. So when we talk about the environmental footprints, including the GHG footprint, the water footprint, uh, the R&D expenditures and CapEx, uh, waste, uh, employee well-being, all of these are already part of the existing BRSR comprehensive. In addition to this, there have been a certain new KPIs introduced that are much more uh, you know, country specific to basically help highlight some of the unique challenges faced by companies when uh, operating in a country such as India. So we are talking about KPIs such as enabling inclusive development, which is looking at how much material inputs are sourced from uh, you know, MSMEs, how, much, how many jobs are created in smaller towns. We are looking at uh, you know, fairness and engaging with customers and suppliers where we are looking at KPIs such as percentage of negative media sentiment and the number of days of accounts payable. And we are also looking at the openness of a business, which is looking at how concentrated the purchases and sales are with trading houses, dealers, and other related parties. Overall, going forward, when we talk about BRSR reporting and assurance, what are some of the key considerations that management needs to have? Uh, I would say that you know there are four key uh, prerequisites when we talk about assurance. Uh, assurance will require that businesses have a very detailed uh, overview of the business process and internal controls. Uh, the businesses will have to have very clear articulation of what methods and calculations are used in generating these disclosures, preparing these estimates. There will have to be clarity on what assumptions are being used uh, you know, with respect to ESG data, as well as with respect to significance uh, and the appropriateness. And last but not the least, uh, there are also going to have to be appropriateness of the data itself, especially the quality and the relevance and reliability of the ESG data. As of today, the applicable assurance standards uh, are going to be the global standards, such as ISA 3000 and SA 3000. But yes, we do know that the Institute is also working on its uh, own standard that may also come into play. The main areas for management focus are business process and internal controls, methods, calculations, assumptions, and data, as we just saw. And when we talk about the process, the process for preparation to start for a reasonable assurance uh, will have to begin early because it does take extensive work in the first year. And it all starts with the appointment of an independent assurance provider. So with that, Madhu, uh, I'm just going to take a pause, hand it back over to you. And uh, you know, happy to take any further questions on the BRSR or on any other uh, queries that the audience may have. Over to you, Madhu. Thank you, Nachiketa. Uh, for this really insightful, uh, you know, uh, note in terms of you know some of the regulatory developments that are very recent and which uh, most of the listed companies now start to think about in terms of their obligation to report, but also a lot of preparation that will go into it and how it is going to impact stakeholders and uh, things like that. And and as you know, there are a number of other things that were uh, that needs to be dealt with, right? And and everybody looks at it very eagerly uh, from a stakeholders, including us and including the investors or the general community. Uh, I, if I may just start with some questions, uh, Nachiketa, the first one mm -hmm. is to you. There has been a lot of changes over the years on uh, in in terms of ESG, right? I mean, and, and more as a uh, as a as a common person, as a as a corporate or as a uh, general person who's curious about this. How has ESG evolved over the years in India, right? I think, you know, and then and you did talk about the last development, which is the BRSR uh, core and the reporting kind of a thing, but really how it has evolved and, you know, where it is right now. Sure, thank you, Madhu. Uh, I think, yes, uh, it is, it would be factually correct to say that, you know, over the years, ESG has evolved from being a very niche concern to a mainstream issue. And uh, it has become an important consideration for all of the stakeholders that you mentioned, you know, the investors, the consumers, the regulators, 
Uh, all of them are now, you know, very uh, keen on ESG. One of the key things that we have seen happen over the past few years is an increase in coverage, uh, you know, uh, which is going beyond just carbon. So while ESG is not a new factor, ESG has been predominantly focused on carbon itself. But over the last few years, we are seeing that change. We are seeing other parameters also come into play with a wider focus on the social and governance part of it. Uh, in fact, you know, companies are already beginning to integrate some of these ESG considerations into their business strategies. Uh, Deloitte's uh, annual CXO survey, the latest one in 2023, which uh, interviewed uh, somewhere around more than 2,000 CSU leaders across the globe, uh, gave up certain interesting insights. Uh, you know, almost 62% of those business leaders uh, felt concerned about climate change on our, I would say, you know, almost frequent basis. So it was pretty much right on top of their mind. And 82% of those leaders actually stated that they have personally been impacted by climate events in the past year, whether it is, you know, disruptions to their supply chain or whether it was, uh, you know, unforeseen weather events uh, or whether it was uh, issues with uh, human rights and issues with uh, uh, employees. Uh, companies are beginning to face the brunt of ESG issues. Coming to uh, India itself, uh, ESG has evolved significantly over time. Uh, it has evolved from a voluntary principle-based practice to a mandatory reporting requirement that is uh, linked to the global best practices. We started with our uh, CSR reporting, then we evolved into the voluntary guidelines, then we went on to the BRR, and today we are at the BRSR and BRSR core, uh, which is really brought uh, mandatory uh, reporting as well as mandatory assurance to the forefront. And this sure. has been the overall journey. Yeah, no, and it is evolving, and I'm assuming that it will continue to evolve until uh, uh, I think it just becomes part of business as usual and part of our life. Uh, so I think, yeah, a lot of steps taken. Pratik, let me get you in here. Uh, one of the very important questions, actually, uh, there is a lot of discussion when it comes to ESG. There is sometimes there's a common myth that, yeah, there is somebody who's going to bother about climate, the business runs separately. And then, I mean, you know, one side is the business part of it and ESG is somebody else kind of takes care of some carbon or some investors or something like that. What, in your view, is the impact of ESG on business? And really the myth is, does ESG impact the financial performance of a company? And what is your view on that? Perfect. Thank you, Madhu. Uh, and good evening, uh, participants. Uh, really glad to be on this call along with you all and share our perspectives. Uh, to answer your question, Madhu, uh, if I have to answer in one word, the answer is a definite yes. And then let's, let's take a deep dive in terms of what could be the important elements that could really change it. To me, uh, the, the effects are both uh, direct and indirect. Right? Let's, let's first start with the, the indirect one, which is uh, the more advanced you are on your ESG journey, the better a competitive advantage the company and the corporate could actually get. Now, as you, as you, as you, I think uh, Nachiketa mentioned, you uh, talked about it in the initial part. The awareness about ESG, uh, it's, it's, it's a, not a, today. It's not a question of an option. Today, it's actually a question of uh, our survival on this planet itself, right? So, it has become a question which is much larger than what was just a boardroom discussion. And hence, people are more and more conscious about what decisions they take. And if they see, if they have two options between selecting between a vendor or, a, or a, any other aspect of customer or any other aspect, uh, the choice becomes much more driven by ESG aspects. And then people are ready to work with those who have a better coefficient in terms of the uh, ESG parameters. And hence, the, the competitive advantage could really go up. And then I don't need to then mention that it has an impact on your top line or your bottom line and then every other aspect that you could think of. The second one, uh, which is in today's world, again, a, a very, very uh, open aspect. I don't need to even talk about it. If you look at mutual funds, if you look at uh, the equity investors across the world, uh, the, the propensity of investors uh, and then financiers to invest in and lenders to invest in entities which are more ESG compliant is, is actually significantly higher than the others. So that's a very important element in terms of, again, uh, a pure financing impact. 
uh, of course, the financial performance goes up. Now, now this is something that probably uh, I could talk about one or two examples. I can talk about ample, but if I just restrict myself to one or two, uh, the more, let's say, let's talk about energy consumption. The more you go towards greener ventures, the more you go towards uh, being a very simple example in this case could be as simple as just going paper free, right? The amount of cost that you could involve uh, in using papers and the cost saving by, by saving those amount of papers is, is a saving. So those elements will come through. And, and I, can, I can talk about uh, various other examples. Let's, let's talk about energy, right? You are talking about energy and then the moment you start using greener options, the options which are cheaper, which are more subsidized, the benefit flows to your bottom line, may not be the top line. And hence the, the benefit from a business standpoint could be direct, indirect, absolutely it is visible. Another example of this is uh, customer loyalty. Uh, today, if you talk about customers, you talk about uh, employees, they are all wanting to associate more themselves more with entities which are more vigilant in the EAG space. And in that sense, that's a, a very important area in terms of how do you attract customers, how do you attract young talent to, to stay and continue with you. Um, another aspect which uh, probably people may not see initially, but you will see the impact over a long term is a reduc re reduction in the regulatory and intervention of uh, legal uh, cases. The more ESG compliant you are, your challenges in terms of uh, violating laws and regulations could be lesser. And then those costs could be a significant saving. While, while companies do not talk about those, I'm sure we all of us know that that is a humongous cost which companies have to, have to follow in today's world. And, it, and last but not the least is in terms of the transparency and accountability that this uh, carries in the market. Uh, also, this is this is pure about, Madhu, I talked about the, the benefits which could be flowing indirectly. But now if you talk about the direct elements, uh, ESG has a potential of changing the entire business structure of corporates. If you're talking about an entity, I don't want to take any particular example, but if because of ESG compliance issues, a company is forced to change its entire base product. The amount of cost which could go into R&D, into replacing your machinery, into re 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 reworking your entire process, and, and, and the, in where, in the investment required is a straight direct impact that could come in. So that, I think these are the elements Madhu, I want to talk about that the impact on business on ESG mm -hmm. is probably going to be much more than people can even envisage today. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and the, these are the myths sometimes I think it is very important to know that it is not like just nice to have thing. It is almost a business imperative, Pratik, what you're saying uh, that, I mean, you know, we can ignore this, but it, it comes at a cost. And then, you know, it's also, it's not just nice to have, but, you know, in, in some time it is going to just be like a mandatory thing for business. And if you don't have, it's just a competitive disadvantage and it will affect your financial performance. Just taking a cue from you, Pratik, Nachiketa, one question comes to my mind is, if it is if it is this important uh, and it is it is part of corporate life of let's say all the CXOs, how do you how do you incorporate these principles into a decision making process a company will have right because uh, and then I after that I I think there are some questions in the chat so I'll pick up you know a couple of them as well but Nachiketa over to you on this question. Sure, thank you, Madhu. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, when it really comes to uh, looking at how to integrate this, uh, there are two aspects to it, right? One is your uh, underst understanding ESG, integrating that within your uh, business practices. Uh, and this involves, uh, you know, to start off with understanding who your stakeholders are and what are their expectations. Uh, so to have clarity on that, and to align that with the vision and mission of the organization. Uh, from that will flow your strategy, how you intend to create value for each stakeholder group. You know, yes, as a company, you are required to create value for your shareholders, but you are also required to create value for your other stakeholders, you know, your employees, your customers, uh, the local communities, uh, the regulators, and so on. Uh, over here, again, you will have to have clear sort of, you know, controls in place, uh, what kind of systems and controls you implement as part of your strategy. Uh, going ahead, you will also have to very clearly identify what is the sort of, you know, framework that you are going to use uh, in order to piece this narrative together. 
yes, mandatory ESG reporting is a part of it, but there is, you know, a lot more that can also be done to provide a much more comprehensive narrative of how an organization or a company is creating value. So to identify the right framework or standard, uh, you know, where it is voluntary and obviously where it is mandatory, you have to do that as part of your regulatory uh, requirement. So to use that standard or framework. Uh, and then to basically, uh, you know, go ahead, do the data collection, identify, uh, processes for generating that data, optimize those processes going forward. Uh, you know, technology automation has a big role to play over here. Uh, and then to prepare this information and disclose this in a regular basis. And this is where, again, you know, you will have your year on your performance, which will again guide you by, you know, looking at your performance, whether you are on track or whether you are missing your track. You know, are you in uh, line to meet the ambitions or the targets that you have established for yourself, or is there something more that you need to do? It is an iterative process. The second side of this coin, uh, Madhu, is uh, you know to give credibility to all of this narrative and all of this information, and which is where I believe assurance really comes into play, because it is one thing for organizations to say that, look, this is what we are trying to do, and this is how we are going to do this, and uh, you know this is our performance. But at the end of the day, uh, is what you are saying you are doing. What's the credibility on that? And as we have seen uh, in the last couple of years, greenwashing is a very serious uh, risk. Uh, regulators globally are becoming you know, really strict on this. And therefore comes the whole third party assurance bit that whatever information you are putting out is you know, credible. And we follow the same practice when we do our financial reporting, right? So all of our financial numbers are audited numbers. So similarly, going forward, all of our ESG numbers will also have to be audited uh, numbers. Right, right. And I think that's a that's a great step because what it does is, you know, there's a lot of information that is floating around. I think it just gives the cadence, credence to, you know, some of the information and then just the credibility of the organizations and what is, you know, there out in the public. I think it just gets a little bit more meaning. Pratik, before I have another question, you know, from my list of questions, but uh, there's a question from Priya, which is uh, right now, I think we heard Nachiketa saying this is going to be like 250 companies and then going up to 1000 companies. What is your take, Pratik, and, uh, you know, on when does it trickle down to MSME and small businesses? I, I think it's not regulatory mandatory, but what is your view on this? I think, uh, Malu, that's a brilliant uh know point and uh, i think sebi uh, our regulators are are driving it in a very different direction now if you look at i think uh, what nachiketa covered in the first part when he talked about the brsr assurance there was a second point which says that the brsr will also trip will be re required for the uh, supply chain of those companies now when we look at the supply chain of the top thousand companies we are not talking about 2x or 3x numbers we're talking about a number which is going to be a, a probably a, a multiple which is going to be uh, multiple times than we can even imagine. Now, uh, and then also, if you look at the points which I mentioned and adding to the competitive advantage, if let's talk about a, a automotive company, a automotive company has, which is an, an OEM, probably works with around thousand small SMEs who are responsible for giving nuts and bolts, plastic moldings for, for building a vehicle. Now, if the automotive company has to achieve a particular uh, rating in terms of its ESG framework, it will be very much dependent on the, the supply chain network of the entity to ensure that the ESG parameters are met at, the, at those particular places. If we talk of pharma companies, pharma companies are actually uh, a lot of uh, dependency is coming from contract manufacturers, which may not be large entities, which could be covered by the top thousand. So the, the push for this particular compliance or this particular objective of, of meeting the EIG requirements is really going to trickle down to companies much faster than we can think of. Uh, today, we are actually, uh, I, can, I can talk about this without taking any names. We are looking at companies when they have a, 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 a bid open for uh, selecting a vendor, they have ESG parameters already put into it. 
And when the initial, uh, when what we call it the technical qualification happens, we are seeing that, that vendors are being dropped down if they are, their EAG scores or compliances are not up to the mark. We are also working on engagements where corporates are actually looking at the compliance by their supply chain through a, a, a reporting. So, so the the answer is actually a definite yes. It's going to trickle down, and the the, the the challenge is it's going to be much faster than we can actually imagine. I hope Priya that that answers your question. No, so in a way you are saying that while the reporting is by thousand companies and then gradually it may increase because the rules on supply chain, because the pressure on business, I think one, it is always good to have this because you know you stand a better chance to deal with your business environment, right? Even if you're a MSME or a small company and then sooner or later, uh, and you are saying it's much sooner than the later, yeah. uh, it is anyway going to happen. So, you know, better to prepare for it. So Priya, that's uh, that's your answer. Uh, Nachiketa, coming to you, there is a question from Satish and maybe I'm just rewording this. Uh, in my sort of uh, language is, I think he's just saying there are a lot of industries which have uh, serious environmental issues and he's given some examples and not everybody meets pollution control norms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and while his question is more in terms of rating, uh, you know, if I have to just elaborate and the question that comes to me on, on this is, there are no real industry benchmarks, right? Versus, uh, you know, what should be the emission norms or a water norms or let's say, you know, anything, right? Even from employee perspective for a IT company versus a power company versus a, you know, a pharma company, right? Different companies have their own different business manufacturing processes and, you know, emission requirements or anything for that matter, which is impacting ESG. In the absence of any industry-wise benchmark, how do the reader compare or benchmark one company's BRSR reported data versus another, right? It won't look similar and it, it may be very different, right? So, no, thank you, Madhu. And I think that's a very pertinent question by Satish. So, I think there are two ways in which the BRSR is, uh, you know, attempting to provide a solution to this. So, the first and foremost is the BRSR, uh, you know, in each financial year, you need to also report the preceding year's uh, impact or the numbers, right? So it is a year-on-year -year reporting uh, by, you know, just the definition of the way in which it has been structured. So even from an internal perspective uh, of the company itself or of the reader of that company's report, looking at a BRSR report is supposed to give you a view of how the company has, you know, improved or whether it has improved or whether it has deteriorated, whatever is the actual picture, right? What is the actual performance of that company on a year on year basis? So that is one aspect of it. The second one, which you rightly alluded to is the benchmark bit. Yes, as of today, we do not have any such standardized benchmark. And all, and this is because, you know, we have had a huge, I would say, uh, diversity of frameworks and standards. We never had a a set of standardized KPIs that were applied to, you know, different companies across different sectors. Everyone was reporting things in their own unique way, which is why it made it very difficult to put these numbers together and look at them from the same lens. Uh, but with the BRSR, this changes, right? The BRSR gives you a set of standardized KPIs. It gives you a clear guidance on how to, uh, you know, estimate and prepare those KPIs. Uh, so that you are all preparing those numbers on the same basis. You're all disclosing the numbers, you know, in the same template. Uh, and it also requires that, you know, you have to upload this information to the government, you know, in the MCA portal in the XBRL format. And there's a reason for that, right? Over time, as this information gets fed into the system, it will provide that benchmark that you are uh, asking for. As you have, you know, three years, four years, five years worth of data, and which you will have pretty soon, because in each year you're reporting two years worth of data, uh, you will see clear benchmarks evolving, where you can say that, okay, on the basis of, uh, you know, GHG scope for emissions, this is what the average uh, or the weighted average is for a particular sector versus, you know, cement sector versus an IT sector. So, uh, in my opinion, a BRSR is actually a solution to this challenge. No, thank you, uh, Nachiketa. This is very important and a lot of questions happening around that area uh, right now as I meet a uh, number of people. And, and as you know, it's not easy to put a benchmark, right? Every industry or every company may be different and therefore while maybe something will evolve, but I think right now 
it is it is moving at a very fast pace uh, pratik uh, one so, of the... uh, if i can just comment on that particular point uh, i think uh, the brsr uh, from my india standpoint is a very bold step and it addresses exactly the concern which you raised today there are so many frameworks available that everybody has a report but every report cannot talk to the other and it becomes very difficult for a stakeholder for an investor for a regulator to take two reports and compare what's happening in fact for the same corporates we can take up two years and they are different so so the, the challenge is how to compare and brsr addresses that particular aspect in a in a very robust form and then that's that's one thing that really we should applaud the regulators for getting in it so it's a very bold move there are uh, very few countries in the world which have made ESG reporting mandatory and to that uh, even an assurance mandatory to that that's right and i think one of the important aspects is with the speed at which has happened and something that uh, i mean a lot of people thought that you know it could take a longer time to come in place and you know i think it's a great thing right i mean it poses its own preparedness kind of a thing but that is always the case but i think everybody has welcomed this uh, i think the next question is again from a reporting perspective now getting into the finance world right uh, now brsr is there there is uh, you know it has to be done most companies will do mandatorily listed companies but there are many who are anyway looking for, uh, looking to do it beyond just the mandatory sort of a requirement so what are the key challenges uh, of this brsr reporting from an internal control perspective that companies must uh, address i think uh, uh, again a very pertinent question madhu in today's world uh, especially when companies are really expanding uh, not in terms of its spread also geographically and uh, and then we going a step ahead where we are not even just going for a limited assurance we are going for a reasonable assurance which is nothing short of a audit that we do for a financial statement uh, and the, the the role of internal controls here becomes very very important for for a few points i'll just bring up one is uh, unlike our financial statement reporting which has evolved over 30 40 50 years uh, the requirement for esg has grown at a very fast pace and and without any one particular regulator driving the entire consistency of the reporting second uh, there are so many different models available in the in the overall uh, arena of uh, ESG reporting that it's very easy to report uh, an element based on a, a formula or a function that you think is appropriate. But, and, and I'm talking from uh, practical experiences, same KPI it could be, let's say, talk about carbon uh, emissions computed by the all units of a corporate, but the methodology used are actually three different. So the end KPI could be same. But the basis on which it is computed is, is very different. And that's where the role of internal con uh, controls uh, becomes very, very important. So uh, in, in addition to that, there are real elements. One is how do you collect and how you manage data is going to be important. Uh, again, as I said, unlike financial reporting system, there is, there is probably no system available today which can really help you uh, start to end take care of your data in terms of a collation, in terms of a consistency, in terms of your data backup. People are having, there are systems now which, which are getting evolved, but it is, it is happening at a pace which is actually much faster than people can even adopt what's happening. So that's the first important challenge in terms of data collation and data management. Second one, which is probably the most important aspect from any ESC reporting standpoint is this risk identification, risk mitigation, and risk reporting. And this is not a one-time event. Uh, there are corporates which are actually reassessing risk on an every six months because what was not thought of as risk today becomes probably life-threatening six months down the line. So this continuous ass ass assessment of what risks are is a very important aspect of this internal controls. Uh, second one is the integration. Uh, as I said, uh, bringing business close to ESG reporting is is very important part. So hence, how do you integrate uh, the different aspects of business is, is very important. So uh, if, I, if I can take a small example, if you talk about 20 years back, if a board had to make a decision of do we uh, set up a plant in this particular place, the questions would be what price is cheap, the, the labor available, what price is the uh, raw material could be available here, what is the energy cost. But the same decision today, if you're talking about, it will be much larger. You talk about the society around the plant. What is the, the damage to the, the water sources? What is the damage to the flora fauna? So if you look at all these elements, they need to be brought in within the, the discussion or the decision framework to ensure that the right decision is taken. And again, for this, the data has to be accurate 
and it is all goes back onto the uh, Intel controls framework for, for any corporate. Uh, fourth area, I, I think I alluded to that, but it is the consistency of data. Uh, year on year, quarter on quarter, unit by unit, or plant by plant, the data has to be consistent. That only is going to increase the credibility and how people rely on it. Uh, and to have all of this, it's, it's very important to have SOPs and then product documents in place, which will help ensure that, that people are, are aware, people are uh, educated, and people are know the, the guardrails under which they have to operate within the uh, framework for ESG. So Madhu, for me, these are the important elements from an internal control framework, which are a must in today's world. Yeah, and 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 people who are on the call with uh, you know finance reporting, internal control, risk managers, uh, in corporate, I think these are important points to note. What Pratik said, Pratik, I'll do a quick add-on to this uh, same point that you just mentioned. Swati has a question as to how tougher will be the adherence of BRSR core and assurance in a company which complex supply chain. I think you already alluded to a lot of details, data points, etc. But is it going to be tough or it is going to be manageable? So, uh, uh, Madhu, the plain answer is uh, this is an area which is not going to be easy for any corporate. Um, and, and unlike, uh, I've been an accountant all my life, and I always say the complex the business, the complex the accounting, I think the same applies to ESG as well. If you're a single product, single plant company, the ESG implications could be simpler. But if you have a, a plethora of uh, supply chain uh, complications to add, your ESG disclosures in the BRSR, BRSR core is going to get uh, much more complicated only based on that. Having said that, uh, the, the, the requirements they have put in is first for the entity and it graduates over the next two or three years into the supply chain. So to that question, Madhu, yes, initially, if they get a hold of what the company expects, then pushing it down to the supply chain will be relatively uh, easier. But again, I'm using the word relatively, not that it's going to be only easier. And Swati, I think what Pratik is alluding to is, you know, unlike a financial reporting where your information resides in one ERP or one place, and then there is a proper organization structure to deal with it on a quarterly basis and half yearly. I think it's it's really a well-oiled kind of thing over decades that has happened. I think we'll have to go through a similar journey uh, and with more complexity around ESG coming from different parts of the organizations, not one place, right? You will have HR coming in, your operations, your plant, you have now supply chain, which Pratik mentioned. I think, you know, so... Depends, I guess, right? I mean, how simple your complex your organization is. Uh, but again, uh, Nachiketa, uh, from this point, I just want to get your experience because, you know, it's easy, simple, complex. I think all this discussion is happening. Are there any global examples of countries adopting similar rules where we can actually learn benefit from, right? And, and frankly, where do you find India in the middle of this global setting that is happening? Sure. Thanks, Madhu. Uh, I think... Uh, the answer to that is uh, many, uh, especially in the last in a few years, we have seen uh, that, you know, most countries, most regulators are sort of waking up to the importance of ESG. Uh, if I had to sort of, you know, uh, name a few, uh, Europe has always been uh, sort of like leading on the ESG front. And therefore, it is no surprise that you know, some of the most rigorous and robust uh, you know regulatory requirements on ESG are coming from Europe whether we talk about uh, you know the TCFD which is the task force for climate related financial disclosures uh, or we talk about uh, the NFRD which was actually uh, implemented way back in 2018 which required you know large EU companies with more than 500 employees to disclose information on their ESG performance policies risks uh, and everything to the very recent, uh, you know, CSRD, which is a Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. And this is, in fact, a very comprehensive directive that has come into force uh, as of, you know, January this year that will require many more companies to report on their uh, ESG requirements. In fact, uh, the CSRD states that, you know, companies uh, that meet two out of uh, three criteria and the criteria is being having more than 250 employees or more than you know 40 million euros in turnover or having uh, you know total assets of more than 20 million euros as a listed company so if you meet two out of the three criteria uh, you will have to report on csrd and there was a recent study done uh, that actually said that you know this actually makes the csrd applicable to more than 50000 companies 
So there is a significant push in Europe uh, when we talk about uh, ESG reporting. In the United States, and uh, again, uh, the SEC has also mandated its climate-related disclosures, which are going to kick in for you know, listed companies. Uh, listed, And these are also very complex disclosures on climate with climate scenario modeling, where companies will have to report on how they are impacting climate uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. Similarly, uh, Canada, Japan, Australia, all of these countries, they do require their listed uh, entities to disclose you know, material ESG risks as part of their public filings. It could be an annual report. It could be in a specific uh, you know, report. Uh, at a stock exchange level, uh, you know, we have the Johannesburg Stock Exchange uh, and we have the Singapore Stock Exchange. You know, they have been two of the leading forefronts uh, who have actually required that companies listed on those exchanges need to publish their ESG reports. So the Joburg Stock Exchange requires companies to publish an annual integrated report, whereas the Singapore Stock Exchange requires listed companies to report a sustainability report on a comply or explain basis. And in all of this, uh, India, uh, as uh, you know, Pratik also mentioned before, has indeed taken a very bold step. ESG uh, is not something I would say very new to India. Indian regulators have been cognizant of uh, the sort of responsibility and commitment of companies beyond their shareholders since a long time. It started with the CSR regulation, uh, you know, in the early uh, 2000s. Uh, and as of today, uh, what India really has is a very robust framework, a very robust standard that allows uh, companies across different sectors to report their ESG performance in a standardized way, while at the same time linking this to some of the global best practices. So by reporting your VRSR, you are also you know, making sure that you, know, you are uh, reporting it at the same level of rigor as required by a GRI or a TCFD. In fact, if you have a GRI or TCFD report, you can cross-reference them into your BRSR report. Wonderful, Nachiketa. Thank you so much. I was only uh, thinking that IFRS or NDAS is complex, but yeah, I mean, you're talking about too many standards and I think, yeah, there's a lot of global stuff going on. Yeah. Well, uh, since you mentioned IFRS, IFRS is also coming out with its own standard, right? So we have the ISSB, which is yeah. also coming out. So we will have the uh, IFRS S1 and S2, which is uh, S1 is your general disclosures uh, and the S2 is your climate-related disclosures. The draft of these uh, standards were already published last year. There was a long public consultation process. And currently, the ISSP that uh, uh, is in the process of consolidating uh, the comments, and it is expected by June 23, uh, later this year, we will have the final standard come out. And as we know, IFRS is the leading standard setting body in more than 140 uh, you know, countries. So again, that is also something that is going to come onto the plate very soon. Thank you. I think really good beneficial this thing for audience. Pratik, uh, the whole world is getting digital uh, and India is taking faster move in digital, right? So what role the technology plays? And we hear in ESG and sustainability performance and things like that, there is a, you know, a bigger sort of, you know, uh, play for digital and technology. So how do you think technology plays a role in enabling companies to report on these uh, sustainability performance, ESG, BRSR, et cetera. What do you see? I think uh, uh, it will play a very vital role. Uh, as I said, most importantly, the space, the pace at which ESG reporting and compliance is, is growing, it's not only about reporting, right? The reporting is the last mile of it. Uh, but ESG and, and technology will have to play a very, very uh, uh, no, uh, role together and talk about a couple of examples where it could be. Let's let's talk about supply chain uh, and then let's talk about a, a pharma company, which, which is probably going to depend mainly on a supply chain in terms of its delivery model. Uh, and, and, and the carbon footprint because of that is, is enormous. Uh, supply chain technology tools could play a very significant role here helping identify, find out uh, with use of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, how the best route could be used to ensure that the carbon footprint could be minimum. Uh, this is in terms of pure business usage. Uh, let's bring an example a bit internal. Uh, 
and this probably is, is very widely widely used in the Europe, where the connection between air air routes and train is, is really fast. Uh, so SAP has a system called as Conquer, and there are add-on apps to Conquer, uh, which helps identify. And when you are, they, they, they really even talk about it as uh, a decision guilt uh, system. Uh, when you are making a choice, and let's say you are taking a, a flight option from going from point A to point B, it will throw up two elements. One, the carbon footprint, depending on the aircraft and the distance you have covered. And third, it can say if you take a second option, which is a, a, a different route or a train option or a road option, your carbon footprint is reduced by so much uh, units. This, this is where it's not just a, a reporting element later on. It actually even... Uh, helping make a decision which is going to be very very carbon neutral so or, or carbon positive so this where this is where uh, technology could play a very very significant role uh, this is mainly from a business and an esg direct impact from an indirect impact uh, visualizations and dashboards this is something very important today what is happening is esg has become a, a probably a quarterly or a yearly exercise but imagine uh, a dashboard available to the CEO and the CFO and the people who are making decisions that this is the, the life uh, impact of your ESG footprint. The answer is very different. The decisions are very different. Uh, people are also looking at uh, uh, a, a board where a what-if analysis should be done. So you want to make a decision and, and what different parameters you could choose and then it would have a different answer. So uh, there could be N number of users on this, Madhu. I can, I can probably go on for another 15 minutes, but it's very important that technology will be playing a very important element in the ESG implementation. Pratik, I know you have deep insights into the next questions that I have, uh, and it is extremely important and relevant for our users and, and participants here. Uh, and Nachiketa did talk about this development about assurance requirement on the ESG disclosures, right? Which SEBI recently came up with. What is your take, in it, take on this, this point? Uh, this affects all the people here, right? There are tax people here, there are finance people here, controllers, CFOs, et cetera, and, and some people who are like on the board, et cetera. Uh, so what is, what is your take? And going forward, what do the companies do, you know, or should do to meet these requirements? And this is a recent topic, right? And everybody has to deal with it very shortly. So. Absolutely, Madhu. Uh, I think the first and foremost for me is the seriousness of the requirement. Uh, uh, once it becomes a regulatory or a, or a mandatory thing, uh, often it becomes a tick in the box. Uh, I think the, the effort at professional level has to be that this doesn't become that. And then this a very important step to ensure that it doesn't go down that path, Madhu, is, is to ensure that the people charged with governance are, are made cognizant of what the requirement is take it up at the utmost uh, senior level, take it up with utmost requirement and, and sincerity, and then push it down. That's the first step for me to ensure that the credibility of the support which goes out is, is of the utmost highest quality. Second, um, I, I see from an assurance standpoint, uh, the use of technology, the use of systems is going to be very, very important. Um, again, as I said, most of the entities which are going to do this are at large, spread across across uh, many cities, if not countries. And for them to collect this information on a timely basis, on an accurate basis, on a reliable basis, and most importantly, that it will also be uh, auditable, is this going to be the important task? And without the use of technology, this may not be might may not be possible. Hence, using that and yes, as a cue today, starting the journey maybe from yesterday and not today also, is going to be very important. Uh, again, uh, people tend to make this to be an annual exercise. Uh, my 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 two piece of or two cents of advice here would be, this shouldn't only be a year in exercise when it becomes too late. I know of many corporates, Madhu, uh, while this requirement is mandated from next year, they are doing a dry run this year. Um, some are going to issue the report public, some are going to use it for only internal management purposes, but they want to know where they are standing. And then it, it's probably a bit late for many, but if you are going to use it for internal purposes, it may not be. You can do the testing today. Uh, as a part of the process, it becomes very important who's going to be a partner in the journey. You need a partner who is probably knowledgeable of you, of your business, and ESG all put together. right? Unlike, unlike a, a normal audit where a person with a financial background, knowing accounting standards and your business, in here, the, the complexity increases because you also need to have people who know climate, who know uh, carbon, who know water, who know waste disposal. So we need a team of 
real good experts who can and work around. So having a very quality partner along with you in the journey is, is probably an important decision. And then people shouldn't hurry into that. Uh, policies and procedures uh, will play a very important part because that's going to be the, the, the entire base structure on which the reporting uh, uh, mountain is going to stand. And unless those are built right from day one, you may have a challenge in, in explaining at the end of the year why a particular stand was taken and then it probably might be too late. Uh, uh, continuous assessment uh, should be done. As I said, this is the evolving area. Uh, things which were considered as uh, pro-ESG uh, actually been turned with some change of events that they are actually con-ESG. So you have to have a continuous assessment done in a, in a very, very uh, fruitful area. And then third, which element I can talk about, which probably to me is, is the key and the crux is how you merge financial and non-financial data together, uh, Madhu, which is going to be very important uh, because seeing both the reports separately is not going to add value how your financial parameters impact on non-financial and vice versa, and merging them as one report is probably the most important element. So I, I think from an assurance standpoint, uh, there are many steps which have to be taken. I talked about the most important ones, but uh, as I can say, I'm mean, probably we are at the top of the R, but the devil lies in details, and, and corporates should probably take a very, very cognizant, careful step in, in going this journey, because this is a step, if taken once, rolling it back is going to be more difficult than going ahead. Well, thank you, Pratik. And I know uh, we are on time here. Uh, it's it's a very, very interesting topic. We still have a lot of questions coming in, you know, on the chat, on Q&A. We are also getting a lot of questions on social media right now. We've covered many of them, but there are many. I don't think, you know, in a session of one hour, we could actually do justice or take up all the questions that the audience has. Uh, we'll try to just look at it. And, you know, uh, I think the, the important point for audience is this is going to be a series. This is one of the discussion we had on ESG, but there would be a follow on a sort of session on a extension of this. So we will try to cover everything in the future session as well. I think, you know, the, real, the importance of ESG now can't be, you know, overestimated or overdone. I think in, in, the, in a sense that uh, it is here to stay. This is most important topic. It affects all of us. And from a corporate perspective, I think Nachiketa did talk about all the rules that have come in, right? You know, why is it important from an investor perspective, the supply chain? I mean, Pratik talked about technology, the internal control, uh, just the and the assurance part, which is extremely important. I think we should not underestimate the time or the complexity. I think Pratik and Nachiketa did allude to it that, you know, while... Uh, you know, some of the requirement may sound, sound common sense, you know, kind of a thing, but just to prepare or get those things in a serious and a sensible way will take time so you know people are preparing early and then you need a partner who can uh, help you has knowledge about the subject i think there's also one question about a csr and esg kind of a thing right i mean i mean you know you you are saying the same thing right in a way that you know esg is much much more wider across organization it has to be ingrained like it's like a culture right i mean it has to be ingrained into the organization and not just like you know some data or some amount that needs to be spent so so I think we are on top of the hour. I really want to thank uh, Nachiketa, uh, you for fantastic presentation and all the answers and Pratik to all the insights that you shared. Uh, I'm sure they're very valuable to the audience out here. We'll try to look at these questions and take this up, uh, you know, the ones that we could not take in the next session. And we don't want to, obviously we are two minutes over time already. So I want to thank you and thank everybody who joined. 